at uh, this AI and what are the motivations behind this challenge and what kind of talent or what kind of uh, mindset you are looking for uh, as well, as well as also just you know, what would be good to see um, at the end of this project. Sounds good. Are we doing this uh, call with a video? Uh, yes, with... we are. We we are we are doing. So we are recording. So if people haven't joined, they will be able to watch. So you mean you can present as you know whatever you can present the challenge document or you can present anything you want, including the the videos that you have in you know that that you uh, linked as well in the challenge document. So feel free to do anything. Okay. Thank you. So let's start. Yes. Um, so hi, everybody. Nice meeting you all. Um, let me pull up my presentation. Just a sec. We can see your screen. Great. So um, our agenda, more or less, is uh, that uh, I will uh, tell you a little bit more about Lizzie. Um, and uh, uh, I will also tell you uh, our motivation for this challenge, what we expect in a very high level. And then Daniel uh, will uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, uh, the RAG process and about uh, his uh, um, uh, experience in Lizzie. So you all have um, um, understanding, a better understanding of who we are, what we are, and what we expect in this challenge. Um, let me start with a very short uh, overview about Lizzie. Please feel free to stop me with questions on anything. So Lizzie um, um, is an early stage Israeli startup. We leverage hybrid LLM technology to build the first autonomous contract bot. I'll talk about hybrid LLM in a second. Uh, um, uh, an autonomous contract bot is an entity that can create, review, negotiate contracts of any kind autonomously uh, without human assistance. Uh, on any uh, type of contract and do it very efficiently. This is our vision. It's a very big vision. It's not fully feasible to date, but with the uh, uh, advancement of LLM technologies, we believe that it will be feasible in the next one or two years. We start with a bit of a more humble approach. Our first product is a co-pilot for contracts. It's a desktop application that integrates with uh, Microsoft Word. It's designated for lawyers or other contract professionals. And the role of the application is to assist in the uh, contract review process. Uh, we help with drafting terms. Uh, we do auto completion of terms. We help with review of terms. Uh, is it standard? Is it uh, 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 compliant with your policy, et cetera? We allow contract Q and A, and that's going to be part. Uh, uh, that that's going to be a major part of our challenge. We're going to talk more about that, and we help uh, the lawyers with quick reference. Uh, we identify defined terms and, and and show them what they are, and quick summary of various elements in the product in the contract. Sorry. Um, we're uh, a team of uh, eight people. Um, the main founders uh, are myself, uh, Netzer, our CTO, and Shai, our uh, NLP expert. Uh, we're all very experienced. Uh, we did uh, uh, many successful startups uh, historically. We sold companies uh, to Microsoft, to Intel, and we know what we're doing. Um, the, probably the most interesting thing about our team is that Half of it is in Israel, and almost half of it is in Ethiopia. Uh, um, I discovered Addis Ababa a uh, few months ago. I didn't know that this was an area with uh, talented developers, but I uh, um, hired someone, um, and it was good, and uh, found out that there's a great software developer market in Ethiopia. 
the people are kind, professional, speak good English and very motivated. And I like it very much. In my history, I've uh, opened offices all over the world, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Bosnia, in India. Um, and I really like what I see here and I decided to focus on Addis Ababa for our outsourcing team. Uh, we had other locations and we closed them and we're now focusing and we're hoping to hire a fourth uh, uh, person to our team in Addis Ababa. Where we stand, uh, we raised pre-seed funds uh, uh, somewhere uh, at the beginning of uh, last year. We did a nice POC. We started a pilot with Meitar. Meitar is the biggest law, firms, uh, law firm in Israel. Uh, the pilot is going well. We're getting a lot of positive feedbacks and effective feedbacks, and we're gradually building our product to go to an MVP, land in March, uh, put it on the web. Um, uh, and that's where we stand more or less. Um, you probably know that as you are in a data science uh, course, but I'll tell you briefly uh, our high level vision about uh, the market and the opportunity for LLMs. So we're clearly in a, in a revolution. Uh, LLM is distorting and disrupting any industry you can think of. Um, here you see GPT-4 taking uh, admission exams for various universities in the U.S. and doing better than the average student on anything in math, in statistics, in history, in art, in, in chemistry. Um, and this is just the beginning. This is from uh, almost a year ago. And on the left, you see our vision about the, uh, where we where we at uh, in terms of uh, uh, the quality of LLMs. So it seems like we're uh, LLMs are doing amazing things today, but in our mind, this is just the beginning. Uh, a few years back, uh, uh, where the transformer were launched, it was a revolution. Uh, last year was a slight peak with the LLM revolution, and we feel it's just starting and it's gonna be exponential in the next few years and opportunities are going to be endless. Everything is gonna change. Specifically on the legal industry where we are uh, playing, uh, the legal industry, legal AI is a tipping point. Again, this is GPT-4 taking the US bar exams, doing better than the average student, more interesting, the evolution of weaker models. So this is over one year um, evolution of about 10 percentile uh, success uh, in uh, bar exams going up to 80 percent. So the uh, improvement is really, really rapid and exponential. On the right, you see a Goldman Sachs prediction of various uh, of potential for uh, uh, AI automation in various industries. Legal is number two. Um, naturally, legal is a language-based uh, profession, and therefore language mo models can improve it drastically. The only thing that um, have more potential is admin. Uh, the key difference is that legal is expensive. So a uh, legal hour probably costs 10 times than admin hour. Therefore, we think legal is probably the most interesting interesting in uh, uh, industry to focus on for AI. Um, we have a unique approach, we call it hybrid LLM. We build a very nice architecture that allows um, uh, running of multiple models uh, at the same time next to each other and very quickly and easily switch them. And we use LLM services like OpenAI, uh, Azure AI and more. We also run our own models, uh, which are open source that we train uh, on our own servers, um, and we provide it as private uh, cloud to customers. And one of the unique things about us is that we also have presence on the client, on the PC, on the Mac. Later on, we're now focusing. We're now we're now supporting uh, PC, and this enables us to run local models. And the more that you go to the left, you get cheaper perform uh, uh, cheaper uh, uh, models you get uh, more secure more private operation um, um, and real-time elements the more you go to the right you get deeper 
and better knowledge and better lo logical capabilities. And our vision is to combine the two uh, uh, paths into one powerful product. Last probably slide uh, uh, before we drill down on the challenge, what do we actually do in terms of technological vision? We take uh, state-of-the-art uh, models, uh, LLM, like ChatGPT by OpenAI, Bloom, uh, Llama, Mistral. Uh, we uh, adapt it to the relevant legal task. And first and foremost, run evaluation tests and see which is the most appropriate for which task. Once we find it, this is the smartest person. We train it to be the best lawyer. We run it through a lot of uh, contracts and other legal documents. Uh, and then uh, we call it internship, internship uh, feed it with insights on how to do tasks. For that, we create a lot of synthetic data. Finally, we need to make this best lawyer a trusted legal advisor. For that, this guy needs, or girl, Lizzie, needs access to the organization documents. Uh, in terms of, in case of a law firm, it's the legal doc repository, the contract. And it needs to be compliant and secure. Uh, and we do private cloud and private model for each law firm. Let's talk about the challenge for a little bit. So um, uh, we're one of the features that we're building is contract Q&A. Uh, this is the inspiration for this challenge. Uh, what is contract Q&A? As I said, uh, we run an application on the desktop that integrates with Windows. Uh, and with Microsoft Word, sorry. Um, and when the lawyer is reviewing a contract, we give him a little or her a little sidebar uh, where they can do actions, AI actions. One of them is have a conversation about the contract and ask questions about the contract. Uh, so they can ask anything. Uh, it's a chat experience and they could also add more than one contract. So many times contracts uh, have appendices and have related contracts and you want to ask questions about the whole batch, so you can do this as well. Uh, why use RAG? Uh, Daniel will talk more about RAG, uh, but in a very high level, uh, and not just run the full uh, contract through an LLM. Um, so, the main reasons are, uh, first and foremost, um, LLM have limited context. So GPT-4 now allows 128K um, uh, documents to upload, which is a lot, but not all of the models allow that. And even that is not enough uh, because contracts are long and come in batches. So uh, a typical deal will have more than one document. Uh, second, um, um, even though models like GPT-4 support big context, they don't analyze it well. So if you run, if you send a very big contract to uh, GPT-4 and ask it questions, it will perform okay, but not brilliantly. Uh, with RAG, you can make it more accurate. Um, and finally, uh, it's much cheaper. Instead of sending a full, very long document, which is very expensive to big models, you send only the relevant chunks. What do we expect in this challenge? So our motivation, as Yabi said, for this uh, 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 challenge is we want to enhance our relationship with Ten Academy. Uh, we want to keep in touch and find potentially uh, brilliant employees for the futures. Uh, that's that's our motivation. That's why we built this challenge uh, to get to know you and to find uh, uh, the stars among you. Uh, what specifically we look for in that challenge? So for us, a good um, uh, solution for the challenge would be a person that created a basic flow and it's working that put an evaluation process in place and suggested solid uh, ideas for enhancement in the future, a PowerPoint, a slide, idea one, two, three, four, five. That's good. Uh, even better if this person is able to implement various chunking strategies, you learn about that and you understand this and 
evaluate and find the winner. That's a very, very good result. So anyone that could get to this uh, means that he did uh, or she did a very good job. And finally, a great implementation is the person, and I don't expect anyone would actually achieve that, but who knows, is the person that would actually implement one more technique that makes sense to improve the rug and will do it successfully. What we look in the candidates, we look, we're going to uh, hear presentations from you, from the, uh, from the achievers. Uh, we want to see deep understanding, we want to see quality code, and we want to see working functionality. Um, any questions before we switch to Daniel? Please feel free. Nothing? Yabi, anything from you? I mean, I was expecting more questions, but somehow it seems, uh, yeah, Perot. Okay. Uh, good morning, Arun. Uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you. So uh, I just have um, a quick question. So I was wondering if it does the LLM uh, your uh, lazy AI bots only yeah. uh, advises the the, the the lawyer or about the contract and how to edit it and the, show him some uh, i don't know weak points on the contract or does it also help with writing the contract does it help like does it write the contract with given with a given prompt that's my question thank you so um our main focus is review and when you're reviewing so giving you comments about the contract, we also help drafting specific sections. So you're reviewing something you want to replace. So you ask, give me a different uh, limitation of liability clause that is more fit to what I'm looking for. Uh, we will add support for a flow for create a full contract. Uh, that would be probably in uh, three or four months from now. Um, but yeah, and what we will do is one, create a contract from scratch, you will tell it what kind of contract you want and it will create it for you and two more important you will put a template and it will say i want to change the template with one two three four five six and it will change it so bottom line the answer is yes okay thank you yeah abel all right thank you arun for the presentation so uh, my question is, uh, is there a specific uh, model that you fine tuned for this specific purpose? Or uh, is it a bunch of models working together? Uh, can you please elaborate on that? Yeah, we work with various models. What of, most of uh, what we do uh, today is with GPT-4 and 3.5. We also fine tune the LAMA model uh, for creation of uh, specific uh, uh, contract cl uh, closes, uh, and we plan to uh, fine-tune more tasks and more model in the future. Uh, we also, one interesting thing that we did is we fine-tuned a very small bloom uh, flavor for the auto-completion, and we also uh, fine-tuned the llama for the auto-completion. So, uh, bottom line, most of the tasks are done with GPT, with OpenAI, some of them are with models that we trained ourselves and in our vision we want to train also the gpt4 model but we're not there yet All right, thank you. uh okay uh hi aaron thank you for uh, the presentation my question is uh so you you uh you said probably we wouldn't do it but just on a concept level, uh, what do you mean by improve something on RAG? I mean, is that something on RAG the concept, RAG the theory, or uh, or something specific in case of your project? And would this require uh, for, for, for for this specific uh, challenge? Uh, the way we look at it um, uh, is reflecting our reality, and let's look at our reality. Uh, it's very easy to put up uh, a Q&A system in place. There are some open source platforms like uh, Langchain or, or Llama Index that you're going to play with, Langchain you're going to play with. 
Um, and it's easy to put up uh, uh, quickly and easily an up and running uh, Q&A system or rug system. Uh, the thing is that it's not working perfectly. To make it work very good, you need to improve it. And there's a lot of little improvements and little enhancements which are generic. Um, um, you starting with the way you chunk your content, going through the way you ask your queries, uh, and the way you arrange the results. And there's a lot, probably between 10 to 20 potential optimizations. Um, so the first task is to understand which are the most important uh, optimization and implement them correctly. The second challenge for us would be to optimize this to the uh, specific flow of contract, because contract is, is not a regular document. It has a lot of unique characteristics, and if you understand them well, you can uh, create flows and enhancements that spe specifically improve the Q&A for contract. That's the way we look at it at least. In the challenge, uh, we did uh, uh, the same thing. So build something basic, find ways to improve it, uh, find the generic ways to improve it and implement them specifically on contract and see what happens. Um, obviously, you can't achieve uh, uh, everything in one week. Uh, this could be a one-year project as well, um, but we wanted to give you a taste. Okay, I understand. I think. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I think before we just go to Daniel as well, I have one question. How much is everything depends on, you know, the country and is are we considering contracts to be a generic object or do we need uh, some form of contextualization in terms of, I mean, for our case, I think for this challenge, I don't think we need much more, but for your case, you probably need uh, for review, for Q&A, especially Q&A that, that involves questions that are like, is this correct or is this legally binding? And things like that, it would need to have context about the country's law. So is that, you know, is that how necessary it is for now versus, you know, what is your approach to that? So two things. First, we currently, uh, so there's a language issue and there's a location issue. Uh, we only support English in terms of language and we don't have any plans to support any other language in the foreseeable future because this is half of the market. And you do need uh, uh, to do some uh, efforts to support specific languages, not only in terms of the experience, but also in terms of the models, of course. Um, the second uh, issue is, is, should it understand local law in various locations? So English is good, but you can be Australian, you could be American, you could be uh, uh, British, and if you're in America, you could be in Ohio, or you could be in New York. So there are issues. But for RAG, uh, uh, it's not really relevant, because what we try to do is ask questions about the contract. We don't try to uh, uh, answer question, is what, like, is this enforceable or is this makes sense or is this standard? No. Uh, for the rug. For the rug, you ask question, what, what does the contract say about this and what does the contract say about that? Um, and for that, you don't really need to have detailed understanding of uh, local law. You just need to have a general legal understanding and understanding of how a contract is uh, structured. For other tasks like contract review, yes, you do need to uh, understand uh, the local law and we will uh, provide in the future uh, mechanisms to adjust for that. Great, so that means the contract object or the contract document is the universe for the RAG project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Rudolf. Okay. I uh, thank you, uh, Anun, for your great presentation. And I would like to ask you um, regarding the, nego uh, the negotiation, because uh, at the beginning you said that the bot, the autonomous contract bot, will be able to view, to negotiate, and uh, answer questions. So, 
for the negotiation part, uh, could you uh, give more detail about that, please? Yeah. First, we're not there yet. Um, as I said, this is one of the elements that are a uh, vision and will probably be more relevant in a year or two. But second, um, uh, LLMs uh, could be great negotiators uh, in the future when they are a, a bit stronger than what they are now. Uh, they will train uh, on negotiations. They will train on legal negotiations. And we envision a system that will have multi-agent uh, uh, environment. Uh, a certain LLM would be an expert in a certain field. A certain LLM would be an expert uh, in negotiation. In negotiation, um, And they will talk among themselves. And they will the negotiate or will try to always come up with uh, what is the best um, uh, suggestion, uh, understanding that the other par party will probably negotiate and what is important and what is less important and how do you implement a strategy where you ask the right thing and getting something else in return. Um, uh, so, bottom line, yes, bottom line, we're going to uh, use LLMs as negotiation agents, um, but we're not there yet. Yeah, if it's not. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I want to understand more about the uh, uh, hybrid LLM. You mentioned that, like, you can um, uh, train different LLMs for particular, like, for different uh, um, tasks. But you also mentioned that you can, you are training also two models for the same for the same task. So how how does it work really? Uh, I... So let me share my screen again. So um, um, uh, practically, we're playing now with a lot of models. But in terms of vision, uh, we see uh, um, on the client uh, some tasks that make sense to do only on the client. And for that, to use relatively small models that are trained specifically for this task. One of them is real-time metadata. Uh, contracts uh, usually have defined terms. And when you edit the contract, you change them. And this is something, you, and this is uh, uh, like a logical building block that is very important in the contract. And you need to constantly track it. So if the uh, definition was changed, you need to understand that the definition of, uh, was changed. Also, uh, the section units is the same. So you need to track this on real time. Like every, every paragraph that was changed, you need to review and, and, and understand and, and restructure your definition uh, model uh, for that. This is something we think uh, uh, makes much more sense to run locally, uh, because otherwise it will be slow and less efficient and, efi and expensive. Another thing that uh, we think is uh, uh, important to run locally is anonymization. So uh, contracts are sensitive. They have a lot of PII and sensitive information. One of the things you want to do before you send them to big models is to anonymize them, uh, to be on the safe side. It makes sense to anonymize them on the client with less exposure of the PII uh, on the server side. And finally, a personal legal profile. Uh, so in our vision, we're going to build a legal profile for every lawyer that is using us. Uh, this uh, uh, Lizzie will understand their preference, will understand uh, their legal preference. What do they do? They like to give a lot of comments, uh, little comments. Uh, do they usually comment on this type of clauses or other type of clauses, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. To do that, you need to track everything the lawyer is doing with contracts. Uh, this is something you don't want to do on the server uh, because of privacy issues mainly. Uh, and it also makes sense to run and train a model locally for that. Um, there are a lot of uh, service-related models, but um, which are good, um, but it's harder to train them. And sometimes not all the law firms would like to work with them. 
So therefore, we also uh, su suggest a third alternative, which is bigger models like uh, uh, Llama and Mistral with the bigger flavors that we uh, run on our server and train them. Uh, for now, uh, we're doing it for specific tasks, uh, but later on, we can do it with more generic tasks as well. So just to and uh, to see if I understand. So you are in each case you are using just one model for a, for a particular task. It's not that you are using two or more. No, we don't. We don't. We don't run two uh, models on a specific task together to get a better performance. No. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. I think then now we can go to Daniel. Uh, it seems. Yeah, makes sense. Daniel, are you ready? And, and thank you, Arnon, because it's really excellent the way that I, I hope that everyone has a clear understanding what is expected as well as also what is the task actually about. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for the clarity. My pleasure. Daniel, are you ready? Uh, Daniel, you're muted. Uh... Okay, yeah, I was talking. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Arnold, and uh, thank you everyone for your time. So first, uh, let me start by introducing myself. So uh, my name is Daniel, and I'm an ML engineer. Uh, I was also a, I'm also a Tan Academy graduate. Uh, I was, I think, uh, on the batch for uh, training session and. Uh, I can understand uh, what you are uh, into right now. Uh, during our time, it was really challenging and it was at the same time interesting. Uh, I really learned a lot uh, from uh, Ten Academy. It opened up uh, doors uh, in my career wise perspective as well as uh, it helped me to grow personally. And uh, I know that it's very challenging and intense for you too. I can uh, expect that, but it paid off. And uh, I, I would like to say it's uh, worth it. So uh, after graduating uh, from Ten Academy, I was hired to a company called Braille Labs. And I stayed there for about, I think, almost two years. Uh, I, did, uh, I mainly did uh, two projects, one a data collection uh, tool and the other one was a model training and uh, testing uh, orchestration automation uh, tool so after that uh, before like uh, eight months i joined lizzy uh, and at lizzy uh, it was really interesting and uh, very ex uh, great experience that i had uh, most of the tasks that uh, we were doing involves uh, LLM, uh, which is really fascinating and interesting topic uh, currently. And uh, I had like so far participated in about four or five projects, and uh, I learned a lot uh, from Lizzie. There are very smart uh, and uh, very experienced uh, people uh, there, and. Uh, the one thing that I like uh, about Lizzie is that most of the things that we do uh, involves researching and experimenting, researching and experimenting. So uh, every time you are learning new things, uh, you are uh, finding new things. So whenever we want to uh, to do some product uh, out there, out there uh, what we do before is to research and experiment and find the optimal solution. So in that process, you are going to learn a lot. So that's, uh, the, uh, that's one of the things that uh, I like about Lizzie. Uh, and for instance, the first project that I did when I joined Lizzie was to create an evaluation pipeline for the uh, models that we use for different tasks tasks and the aim of that project was in order to find out the optimal uh, model as well as the model configuration uh, for the tasks that we use and that means uh, I was really engaged in uh, experimenting and testing the model so 
uh, you can say that uh, it's uh, some kind of research and it, uh, that's something that I like uh, in my work field. And uh, the other uh, thing uh, at Lizzie is that uh, most of the time you work independently, but uh, there are uh, many, uh, you, there are smart people out there that uh, you work hand in hand, uh, you can ask, uh, they will give you consultation, suggestion, advice, and from that uh, you are going to learn a lot. And every line of code that uh, we wrote, uh, we will make sure that it is a, in a high quality. Uh, and uh, from engineering pers perspective, uh, also you are going to acquire uh, very great skill, uh, I could say. So uh, that's more or less uh, about myself and uh, about my experience on Lizzie. Uh, from the projects that I did uh, after uh, doing after uh, doing the evaluation pipeline uh, model evaluation pipeline project, I also uh, participated in uh, building a pipeline for fine tuning models like uh, Llama. Uh, Blue Mistral, uh, and also the other project that I did was, uh, yeah, creating a synthetic data or uh, extracting uh, components of or uh, building a data structure for contract documents. And uh, one of the things that we are interested on is that as you uh, most of the contracts have uh, these interesting sections that uh, that needs to be extracted for example they have there is a section uh, for defined terms uh, there is a section stating uh, which parties are involved in a contract uh, and there are also sections for clauses and sub clauses so we wanted to extract those information from uh, from a contract by leveraging LLM. So that's uh, one of the interesting projects that uh, I did also. Uh, I think like building a, uh, a data structure and also a table of content for a contract document. So uh, that is uh, from my experience at Lizzie. Uh, now uh, let me move on to the rag tutorial uh, if i may yeah please daniel okay good so i'm going to share my screen uh yeah we can see your screen okay good So let us start with the, an introduction about RAG. So uh, why, what is RAG and why do we need RAG? So uh, uh, RAG or Retrieval Augmented Generation is uh, a, an approach to enhance the capability of LLMs in order for them to uh, produce or generate uh, an accurate answer for a question on a specific domain so uh, this is done by first uh, there are two components on a rack the first component is called the retrieval system and the second component is called the generation system so uh, what we are going to do is that first we are going to uh, the aim of rag is to answer questions on a domain specific knowledge base so first we are going to build uh, a knowledge source uh, for the llms to use and uh, the second thing would be uh, whenever a question is asked to a rack system the retrieval system will try to uh, fetch or extract relevant uh, documents from the knowledge source that will help the LLM to generate uh, an accurate answer. Then uh, after the retrieval system retrieves re uh, relevant document for the question that's being asked, then we will uh, give the question as well as the, the retrieved documents to the LLM so that the LLM can generate an answer for our question. So uh, it will know uh, 
uh, it will the LLM will have an idea from or will have an information to answer our specific uh, questions. So that part is called the generation uh, system, and the first part is which is retrieving uh, relevant document is called the retriever uh, system. So. So we can say that rugs are uh, domain-specific uh, QA engines. Uh, when I say QA, that means uh, question and answer engines. So why do we need rug? Uh, why don't we use uh, LLMs uh, directly, like calling ChatGPT for uh, uh, directly? Uh, so the first thing is that uh, LLMs model does not know your data. They are uh, trained on generic public data so that they can answer uh, generic question. And uh, that means they don't know their your data and uh, maybe answering uh, the question that you uh, ask might require a domain knowledge. And also uh, the data that the LLMs are trained on are uh, static, uh, so they can be outdated uh, and they may not have the recent information that's required to answer uh, a question. Yeah. So we have also talked about providing domain specific and for uh, relevant response. And the other thing is that by only uh, instructing our LLM uh, with information that are needed to answer uh, your question, you are going to mitigate or decrease the risk of uh, the LLM to, to hallucinate or pro, uh, fabricate an incorrect answer because you are going to say, uh, this is my question, and you are going to base your answer uh, based on this information. So the LLMs uh, will have a, a, a low probability of uh, fabricating or has, uh, hallucinating uh, an incorrect answer. So, with respect to uh, domain knowledge, uh, we, for instance, one might say, uh, what if, if we find, uh, if we customize the LLM model so that uh, it knows uh, our data, meaning that uh, what if, if we trained the LLM on our data so that uh, it has uh, a domain knowledge? So, the problem with this is that it's going to be expensive and uh, in, in terms of uh, time, in terms of setting up the infrastructure, and as well as uh, you are going to need uh, lots of data in order to fine tune uh, an LLA model. And keep in mind that even if we do it in this way, the model, uh, the data that the model is, going, is trained on is going to be static and we have to update it frequently and that's going that's not going to be cost effective uh, for uh, a a task like QA so that's why rag is important so let us move on uh, to the rag architecture so first uh, let us see uh, how the rag process uh, works so here we have first a knowledge source for example if uh, for the key way uh, regarding uh, contracts we might have uh, a knowledge source uh, about contracts here and when a person asks a question or, or when it gives a query first the query uh, first the query is going to be sent to the retrieval system to fetch relevant documents that uh, that are uh, related to the question or to the query and when this relevant information is returned, then we will uh, we will include the relevant information as well as the question uh, in the prompt uh, that we prepared, and we will send that to uh, the LLA models, uh, the, the LLA model that we use for generating an answer, and the LLA model is going to respond to the question. So this is the high level of the RAG process. So this part is called the retrieval system, and this part is called the generation system. And when we look to the RAG architecture, uh, so the first thing to do would be to create your knowledge source. So you have a source of data uh, here, then uh, you are going to load it and 
to create your uh, knowledge source. So how is going? How is the document going to be stored in your knowledge source? So the first thing to do is that uh, first you have to chunk your uh, document into sections. Uh, so it's going to be set of uh, sub documents. Then those chunk chunks are going to be embedded uh, into uh, vector representations. So each chunk is going to have its own uh, embed uh, embedding vector. And uh, those embedding uh, vectors is going to be stored in a database called uh, vector DB or vector uh, store. So whenever a query comes in, the query gets embedded, meaning that it will be going to be transformed into a vector. Then since the query is a vector and uh, in our knowledge source, we have a set of vectors, we are going to use uh, 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 a method like cosine similarity in order to fetch uh, the most similar uh, chunks uh, that are related to the query. Then when that's returned, we will uh, include the text of the chunks as well as the query and send it to the LLM. Then the LLM is going to produce the output. So uh, that's just to, to give you an insight uh, on how RAG works. And let us go, let's move to the main components of the RAG and uh, also things to consider on building a RAG system. Uh, this is going to be just a high level. So the first thing uh, is we are going to start with the data, right? And the first step to do is to, to create your knowledge sources to break down your data into a list of chunks. Why we are going to do this is because uh, uh, as uh, Arnon explained previously, LM, LLMs have uh, limited context window. They accept, uh, uh, they have a token limit. So uh, we don't want to provide all the data that we have in the knowledge source to the LLM. So we only want to uh, provide to provide the, rele the relevant chunks that is related to our question. And the other thing is noise reduction. Uh, we want to send only relevant documents to LLM as a context that's uh, important to answer uh, the specific question that's uh, asked. For instance, let's say uh, if you have a video of uh, a three hours, a three hour video, and that talks about AI and at uh, minute 27 if there is a topic about that talks about rag so if you want to know about rag you don't have to look to you don't have to watch the whole video you only want to uh, go to the 27th uh, minute and uh, go to an inf get an information uh, from that section. So that's what we are doing here. We don't want to provide the whole data uh, to the LLM. We want only to provide the relevant documents so that noise can be reduced. So when I say noise, that means uh, unwanted information or unrelated topic to the question. So how are we going to check the data? So. Uh, are we is that uh, what is that uh, what is the optimal chunk size so the way to do it, the, to the way to find the optimal chunk size is by experimenting but here i will uh, uh, tell you a high level concept about small chunk size and long chunk size so if our chunk sizes are small, uh, this leads to an accurate retrieval, meaning retrieving the most similar chunks to your query is going to be uh, effective. That's because uh, your query is going to be most of the time uh, small uh, compared to the chunks. So if your chunks are also small, the, when calculating the cosine similarity, uh, you might uh, you will you will have a high probability of uh, fetching uh, the most uh, similar chunks uh, from your knowledge source. Uh, so, but the downside of uh, using a very small chunk size is uh, it might not provide the full context to the LLM because they are very short. And when you break uh, 
some text into short contents, it might lose the context. So that's uh, one of the disadvantage. And what about using long ch chunk size? They provide much better context to the LLM, uh, but they may contain noises or unwanted information for the LLM. Uh, and uh, the retrieval step might not be optimal because similarity search might not be accurate because uh, your query are usually short and that if the chunks are very big, uh, the similarity search might not be effective. So you have to do some trade-offs uh, between uh, those two concepts. And there are also uh, some chunk strategies uh, for chunking your data. Uh, the first one is the naive chunking. Uh, this is just simple. It's, it just simply tries to break down the document into chunks of a specified uh, number of characters or uh, instead of number of characters, you can, uh, you can specify your chunk size by number of tokens. So this is very simple to implement, but it does not consider the underlying structure of the document. Uh, in this approach, uh, you might uh, break uh, a, text, a text in the middle of a sentence or in the middle of a word. So uh, it, it's not considering the underlying, uh, the underlying structure of the document. The other one is recursive. Uh, and uh, recursive chunking method, uh, Langchain provides uh, the implementation for uh, recursive chunking. And in this method, uh, what it does is that uh, we first divide the text into smaller chunks in the hierarchical and iterative manner, manner using a set of separators. So what it does is that uh, if you have a text, first it will, and if you define some chunk size, first it will try to uh, split the text into set of paragraphs and it will check uh, if, the initial attempt of splitting the text, meaning splitting it, is splitting the text into paragraph, produce chunk, the chunks of the desired size, uh, the chunk size that uh, you specified. But if some of the program, uh, the paragraphs has uh, has uh, longer chunk size than the one that you specified, the paragraph is going to be split into sentence. And then it will also check if uh, those split uh, split uh, those settings uh, satisfy the desired chunk size. And if if that does not happen, it will split it into words. So first it will try to uh, chunk it into list of paragraphs. Uh, and if that does not provide chunks of the desired size, it will, uh, it will split the paragraphs into sentence, then words. So this is how recursive chunking strategy work. This will try to, uh, considers the underlying structure of the document at high level, but it will not consider the content of the content of the document uh, or the semantic of the document. So we have another kind of uh, chunking strategy, which is called semantic chunking strategy. Uh, this chunking method aims uh, to consider the content also. So uh, it aims to extract the semantic meaning from the embeddings, then assess the semantic relationship between these chunks. So the main idea in here is to keep together the chunks that are, uh, that have, uh, that are semantically similar. So let's say, for example, first you break down a document into list of sentences or list of pair of sentences then uh, you will you are going to put uh, similar uh, sentences or statements that talks uh, about similar topics in uh, a single chunk so in a chunk you are going to have statements that uh, talks about a similar topic uh, so so that's the idea of semantic chunk there are also other kind of uh, structural uh, chunking strategies that are specific for different document types. For example, there is a, an HTML-based chunking for HTML documents that will look uh, HTML tags in order to check a document. Uh, the same is true for markdown chunking for markdown documents. 
so that's regarding the chunking strategy. Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about is the vector store. So uh, previously, I I mentioned that uh, the embedding vectors uh, for your documents is going to be stored in a vector store or in a vector database. So, uh, so vector store. Uh, stores and manage high dimensional uh, vector data for your text and what is embedding vector it's just a numerical uh, representation of the text but these numbers are not just random they hold the semantic information of the text uh, so that's what it means by embedding vectors and these embedding vectors is going to be stored in a vector store and there are lots of uh, vector stores out there uh, for example there is uh, uh, chroma qdrand fast so there are many uh, vector stores out there that you can use uh, and what are the things to consider in uh, using a vector store so the first thing is going to be is querying uh, query speed. Uh, so is the vector store uh, very fast or slow to uh, to be queried or uh, to build its indexes? So in terms of query speed, indexing play a major role. Uh, so indexing is a way to restructure your vector data or you embedding vectors in a vector store so that searching uh, all similar documents can be fast and efficient and there are different methods of inde indexing so is your vector store uh, support uh, what kind of indexing so this is something to ask uh, so you can say uh, so to put it in an example for ex for instance if you want to uh, buy let's say an apple uh, uh, from a supermarket what you are going to do is that you are going to move to the fruit section and we look for an apple if you don't find there then you are going to go out from the supermarket you don't have to look each section in the supermarket searching for an apple right so this uh, what indexing tries to achieve so it tries uh, to restructure your documents so that items can be found uh, very easily and uh, in a fast way for instance this can be done by uh, keeping together uh, chunks that are similar uh, at, uh, at as a neighbor so that's what indexing uh, does the other thing uh, is the accurate retrieval uh, whether the vector store uh, whether the vector store return, returns accurate, uh, relevant documents. So this depends on the the similarity method that it uses. So if the similarity method that it uses is very good, then uh, it will it can extract uh, relevant document based on your query. But if it's bad, uh, it's not going. Uh, so there's going to be some noise on the documents that is going to be extracted. So the other thing to get, to consider is going to be flexibility. Do your application require uh, frequent updates uh, of the, the knowledge base? So, or is it static? If your vector store that you are using uh, is very uh, expensive to update the knowledge base, then uh, you have to reconsider. And if your application requires uh, real-time update, uh, frequent update on your knowledge base, then uh, you might need to consider it. And with, if you want cloud integration, so there are vectors, uh, there are uh, vector stores provided by uh, cloud services like AWS and Google. So uh, this is something also to consider. Now let's move to the query parts. So. Uh, to generate an accurate answer, uh, it does not only depend on the retrieved information given, but also uh, by the LLM model that you are using and uh, the query prompt that you provide. So we don't have control over the LLM, uh, or it might be expensive to customize the LLM, but we can optimize our 
query so that we get a more accurate answer. So uh, this is where we come to query optimization. So in order to optimize our query, there are uh, different approaches. So uh, the so the idea is that maybe your query is not uh, good enough for uh, for generating an answer that you are looking for. So it is uh, improving your query so that a more accurate answer uh, is generated. And the first uh, strategy for optimizing a query would be a query expansion with a hypothetical answer. So uh, the vanilla implementation of retrieval system, if we look at that, uh, it, is, it is going to uh, search for relevant documents based on the query. So it's only considering the question that's being asked in order to uh, fetch similar documents, right? So what if, if, we inca if we can improve the query, if we inca improve the retrieval system so that if we can help the retrieval system so that uh, it will also consider our expected answer in order to uh, fetch similar documents. So not only the question that's being asked, but also our expected answer, the answer that we expect. So if the retrieval system fetches uh, really one doc relevant documents in such a way, then uh, we can uh, have an improved answer on the generation step. So the way to do that is that first uh, we are we are having the original query, and we will prov we will send this original query to the LLM by saying uh, this is the query, uh, this is the question that I want to ask, and uh, generate for me a hypothetical answer because we are not giving the info we are not giving the information that's needed for the LLM so we are just saying uh, just give me a hypothetical answer for this question then the LLM will uh, produce a hypothetical answer for this uh, question and this is going to be our expected answer so then we will include this expected answer as well as the query and we'll uh, send it to our retrieval system so that our retrieval system fetches relevant documents by considering not only our question, but uh, also the hypothetical answer. Then after the retrieval document uh, sends us uh, the relevant documents, then uh, we're going to send those relevant documents along with the question to the generation component of the rack. So this is how query expansion with hypothetical answer works. Uh, the second strategy is query expansion with multiple query. So in this question, in this approach, given a query, we will ask the LLM to generate list of any queries that are related to the original query. So, and the goal here is to retrieve different topics that are not import that are important for answering our question. So, let's say, for example, uh, our question is like, uh, what is what is the most successful uh, tech company in the in the world? So, if this is our query, then we are going to send this query to an LLM, and the LLM is going to generate for us uh, questions that are related to this uh, topic. So one augmented query or one generated query by the LLM would be like, uh, what are the factors uh, to, to say a company is successful? Uh, or uh, another question might be like, uh, what is the total income of uh, the the average income of uh, tech companies in the last uh, five years so these questions are related to uh, the original query and it will help uh, the llm to answer or to provide uh, an accurate answer so after those new queries new queries are generated, uh, we will send these new queries as well as the, the original query to the retrieval system so that 
uh, we fetch documents that are related to the original quer query as well as the new queries that we expanded then those documents are going to be sent to the llm and the llm is going to have a high probability of uh, producing a correct uh, answer because it it knows it now knows uh, many topics that are uh, important for answering a question and one thing to note is that we have to make sure that the additional queries that are generated are not just rephrasing rephrasing the original query so they must ask a different question but those questions should be related to the original question it's it does not have to be if it is just rephrasing the original query then that's that's going to be pointless and the other uh, optimization technique is uh, using embedding adapter uh, to save time i will not go into uh, details on this but uh, uh, I will invite you to uh, read about this also and uh, let us move to the RAG evaluation okay yeah uh, we are uh, there so uh, as I told you uh, before uh, at Lizzie one of the culture that I saw is that we need to experiment and uh, research on the products that on the things that we do uh, before uh, before uh, putting the solution uh, into a production so that we can uh, put the optimal solution in a production so a, for the rug also the same is true we need to evaluate our rug so that we can enhance or improve uh, our rank systems and rag evaluation is to measure how well our rank is our rag is doing and uh, as i said before there are two components of rag the retrieval system and the generation system so uh, the, we have to evaluate uh, both separately it's recommended to evaluate both separately to know the source of error or the source of uh, the place where we should improve uh, and uh, why is uh, RAG evaluation challenging or uh, LLMQA uh, systems are challenging to evaluate? So first, what, why don't we use a deterministic metrics? So when I say determinist, deterministic metrics, it's like a cosine similarity or metrics that uh, depends on uh, like say word overlap and uh, some mathematical equation in order to uh, score the accuracy of an answer. So this is uh, difficult to do because, uh, for example, a very good answer might have a different might have a different phrasing from the one that we put as a ground truth or as a reference so uh, that's not going to be ideal way to do uh, for instance let's say if our question is is paris uh, the capital city of france then the chatbot answered yes and if our ground truth is uh, no if our ground truth is yes and if the chatbot answers uh, paris is the capital city of france then the chatbot have generated a correct answer but if we use a metric like cosine similarity or uh, some metric that depends on uh, word overlap then those two things are not uh, the metric will say this is a very bad answer because uh, the ground truth yes and the what the chatbot has answered uh, will have a does not have any word overlap and their embedding vectors is are going to be uh, very different so uh, that's why it's not ideal to use uh, deterministic metrics like this uh, what about using a so we need uh, a qa evaluation systems that's something like a human judgment so one of the closest uh, thing to human judgment would be to use llm to directly give a score 
for our uh, questions. So what we are going to do is that uh, we are going to say uh, for our evaluator LLM, we are going to say this is uh, the question that I asked to a chatbot and this is uh, the answer that it generated and the ground truth answer that I have is this and uh, give this a score, let's say from range of one to 10. So something like that. Uh, but this has also a downside uh, and recent studies shows that LLMs are best for scoring a QA answer. So for instance, they prefer long responses rather than short ones. This is found on uh, some study. And also, if you instruct an LLM to select a score from a range of score, uh, they are going to tend to be best to a certain value. So, uh, so there is one library that we found uh, currently for evaluating a uh, RAG system. And that's called Ragas. So Ragas is a framework that helps you to evaluate your uh, RAG system. So in, under the hood, it will use LLMs to uh, to evaluate your RAG system, but it will use LLM in a different in a in a different way so that it can uh, decrease the issues that are listed out there. So. For instance, uh, there are uh, four, there are around eight metrics currently, uh, or seven metrics uh, that's, uh, that's used by Ragas. Uh, but four of the metrics uh, are outlined here. But you can uh, start, you can read it in their uh, official site. So they explain how they do that. Uh, and uh, what the, each matrix refers uh, to. So just to save time, I will not go into details on this. Uh, you can read uh, about it. So yeah, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, about the tutorial that uh, I prepared for RAC. Uh, so thanks so much, Daniel. I think that was, um you know, a good overview from end to end. So that's really, uh, thanks. And there are some questions, it seems, Daniel. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, on your presentation slide, uh, I have seen that uh, different file types, I think. Uh, so should we just uh, build the pipeline for in order to retrieve uh, the, the data type that you are that you have shown us, or we are going to just retrieve only the text part. So uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly. Uh, is that about uh, supporting multiple uh, document types, or uh, sorry? Can yeah, yeah. It's about supporting about. Uh, multiple uh, document type for so, the, uh, the retriever. I'm okay, talking. yeah, yeah. So I would say uh, for this challenge, uh, I would say if you can work with a docs uh, document type and it takes data, uh, that's uh, enough. Uh, do you have any suggestion, Arno? So um, um, for various uh, documents, uh, there are various uh, document uh, retrievers uh, in libraries like uh, Langchain. So uh, you can uh, easily parse uh, HTML, you can easily parse PDF, you can easily parse uh, various types of uh, uh, documents. And these are available in projects like uh, Langchain and others, or you can develop them yourself which is useless, I think. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, my second question is, uh, you have shown us many types of chunking methods, and uh, uh, previously we have uh, worked on a couple of projects, and uh, we already tested some of the chunking process, so could we just test uh, all of them, or we choose uh, the one we, we found uh, better, or? which performs from the given chunking methods. So
so uh, I think the main goal of the challenge is uh, for you to build uh, an optimal uh, frag system. So uh, for instance, uh, in this challenge, you are going to use a contract data. Uh, so in other challenges, I don't know what kind of data that you use. So what I would suggest is that uh, for you to uh, experiment on different kinds of chunking strategy as well as some uh, some variables that can be configured so uh, if you reach on the evaluation step then you are going to evaluate uh, your rack system and uh, go with the one that's producing uh, an optimal solution so you might uh, you might put the process uh, that you, you used in order to reach to this point in your presentation or in the report that you are going to provide. So uh, the, it would, the bottom line is uh, the main goal is to for you to create uh, an optimal uh, rack system. So uh, I would suggest if you experiment on the different chunking strategies uh, on a contract data and uh, use the one that's producing a good result. Okay, so we need to showcase uh, each of perf performance. So in order to just compare which one performs better. So you can outline yeah, this process in your report uh, so that we can know uh, how you reach you reach there so okay thank you hey hey daniel uh, sorry before you take another question i i gotta drop off the call i wanna um leaving you with daniel i want to uh, say uh, thank you very much uh, for participating um in this uh, session and i wish you all great of luck and uh, to enjoy and to learn and see you soon Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Arnon. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, we have one question, Arun. Hello. Arun, you can speak. Yes, I hear me. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the RAC system, we have uh, two pipelines that are indexing in the, the RAC pipeline. The indexing pipelines are the extract technology from outsource, and the RAC are the retrieval and generation uh, input. So uh, the, <coughs> there are uh, three factors. The first one is the index line pipeline uh, factors. When we chunk, there are a lot of meters. So uh, we should choose the best one, and when we embed, there is also uh, much more uh, embedding libraries, so we should select the best one. So when we evaluate the RAC system, uh, we, when we uh, select the, when we evaluate the RAC system, can we automatically optimize all the steps at once? I think uh, uh, one is one affects the other, uh, whether or not it affects or not. I think uh, you got my question. Yes, I, I think uh, I have an idea of your question. So, uh, so uh, as I told you in the slide, uh, I, I I don't think I forgot to mention it. So the Ragas library that I found for evaluating Rag uh, have matrix uh, for evaluating the retrieval component as well as the generation components. So. Uh, so in that way, you can know in which part of the component uh, that needs to be improved. But uh, they are dependent. So if the retrieval uh, component is improved, then the generation uh, component is going to be improved. So from the generation step, there are uh, you cannot uh, modify the LLM, uh, or you don't have control over the LLM. So uh, what you can optimize is uh, your query uh, and uh, also, yes, to use some of the 
some of the query optimization technique. And uh, from the retrieval component, you can uh, play with different embedding uh, models to see uh, which one is good. And you can also, uh, I, for instance, you can also play with some vector stores. For instance, I read a blog uh, about that compares chroma with FIAS and saying that uh, FIAS has a more uh, accurate uh, response than chroma. And also with the chunking strategy, with the chunk size, uh, the chunk overlap. So uh, from the retrieval side, you can uh, do things like that. So, Kerut. Uh, Uh, I think you are muted. Okay, Rod, if you are speaking, you are muted. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I just have a connection issue. So, uh, good morning, uh, Daniel, and th thank you for the presentation. I have uh, one question and one, uh, I, I just want to hear your insight of uh, an idea. So. Uh, what do you think about having the same uh, LLM model uh, for generating the prompts and evaluating itself, and also generating or uh, fetching the, the ground truth? So uh, I want to hear your idea. So doesn't don't you think that? So the last project we did, I was not noticing that uh, all the prompts and all the evaluation were higher because we use the same model to fetch the data uh, and evaluate itself. So it was like uh, correcting itself and some things uh, like that. I hope it makes sense. Uh, so do you think it's wise to use different models, say for example, GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 uh, for evaluating and for generating? And the second thing is, I want to, uh, I just want to hear more about how to generate the ground truth because we, I think we are pitching the context, and I want to hear your insight on that one too. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Let me start from the second question. Uh, for ground truth uh, in this challenge, uh, we have prepared uh, some QA uh, question and answer that can be used uh, for evaluating your rack system. So. Uh, uh, you don't have to go through generating the ground truth answer uh, using chat GPT or something like that. Uh, so uh, that's for the second question. Uh, for the first question, I also read some, I think I have read something like, uh, something that says that uh, LLMs are best towards uh, evaluating their uh, QA answers because they prefer they prefer an output uh, format that is <coughs> similar to their self. So that's why uh, one of the issues with using uh, LLMs for evaluating uh, a RAC system, uh, that's why we introduce uh, a library called uh, RAGAS uh, for evaluating your RAC. So uh, if I let me share my screen again and uh, and maybe give you an insight on how Ragas uses LLM in order to uh, score uh, a RAG output. So as I said before, there are uh, different metrics that uh, Ragas has defined. For, for example, the first one is going to be faithfulness. So this will evaluate if the generated answer is backed by the context or by the information that's provided. So what it does is that first it breaks the output uh, into a list of statements and then asks the an LLM, uh, sends the statements to LLM saying, does this statement is supported by the context and the LLM is going to answer yes or no. So uh, it's not going to give it a score uh, from zero to 10 or something like that. It's going to just 
uh, answer uh, is going to say this statement is backed by context or this statement is backed by is not backed by a sentence then it will take the ratio of the correct statements and that will be the score of the faithfulness so uh, the number of statements in the outputs that that are backed by the context uh, over the total number of statements that are out uh, that is uh, found in the output so that's going to be the faithfulness metric so uh, this is how uh, ragas uh, are using uh, llm so they use the llm in a different way so that they can decrease uh, the issue of uh, being passed Uh, yeah, so uh, we did work, work on RACAS and uh, Monte Carlo and other uh, evaluating systems, and uh, we did uh, see some effect of uh, that. We thought we, we just mentioned uh, the LLM being biased, and that's why I just wanted to hear your insight. Thank you. It was very informative. Okay. Here we go. So then we will stop just with Fan Man at the last question, just because okay. we have it. Okay, Daniel, thank you for your presentation. I just have one question. I would like to know what will be the, the format of the contract data. Uh, okay, the, the format of the contract uh, data, meaning the contract document. Yes, because you know, uh, based on the, the document you want to, to retrieve, we will we will know which kind of uh, loader will be used to chunk okay. after you know okay so uh typically uh it's it's uh, going to be uh, a text data or a docs type data it's not i don't think it's it's not going to be and uh, for this challenge uh something like html data uh, but what you can do is that uh, Langchain provides different kinds of loaders and to find to know what kind of data uh, what kind of loaders to use you can uh, add a code that can uh, get the mime type of uh, a document so that you can use the correct document loader uh, after found finding the mime the type of the document yeah okay, uh, thank you okay and Manuel. uh okay hi guys uh and daniel thank you for your tutorial so i'm, I'm i raised my hand before because i was asking i was going to ask about the, also the data and the answers that are going to be provided uh, but you answered it, but then it wasn't clear for me. So I'm going to ask again. So the data you provide in the queries that are given, do, will they have an answer that we are going to compare our RAG system with? Yeah, I mean, yes. we're going to use the RAGAS for the RAG pipeline, but the issue before was like, we didn't know if the answer provided by the RAG system was correct or not. So it would be really great like if we had you know, an answer to compare it to so that yeah, you can yeah. So in the challenge document, uh, there is a, a data with a question and a ground truth so that you can evaluate uh, your RAG system. So uh, we have a pre prepared uh, some questions as well as the ground truth for that questions so that you can use that uh, as a reference for evaluating your RAG. And uh, by the way, uh, this is Ragas is one of the evaluation libraries that I found. So you can uh, you, there, there is no restriction on uh, uh, what kind of library to use for evaluating your rag. Uh, it's just an example. So uh, I think Langchain also has its QA uh, correctness metric. So you can search and use the one that you thought is uh, good okay great thank you okay so uh shall i wrap up uh, with this uh yeah we uh yes absolutely so let's just close so i moved just the data because it was in section three 
Oh. I moved it now as just data for evaluation as just a new section. So uh, those those of you who hasn't seen it, that it's there. Okay. Yeah, Daniel, wrap up. I think that's okay. So uh, I would like to say uh, good luck with the challenge, and uh, uh, I know that. Uh, the training is really intense, and I want to encourage you uh, by saying that it re it's really worth it. After uh, ten academy, most of the tasks the tasks that you do in the industry, uh, it's not going to be new for you. So uh, you are going to have all the skills that are necessary, uh, as well as uh, you are going to be confident on learning new things. So. Uh, uh, I would like uh, to give you an encouragement uh, on this and uh, good luck. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks the, for the positive words as well earlier and now. And I hope that people are already at the 11th week and they feel it, but your words probably also gives them a more, um, you know, it's like uh, more evidence. Okay, thanks everyone. And we can stop the recording Tain Academy team and thanks Daniel for the insightful tutorial and so good luck yeah but we can stop uh, ten academy team but rudolph if you have you can ask questions yeah, yeah just a last question uh can we have the linkedin of